Hello and welcome everyone to Leading Through Remote Learning. I am super excited to be here today. My name is Dr. Nathan Langrad. I have my friend and co-host with me today, Rochelle Denae Poth. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, excited Rochelle. for today. Yeah. Um, looking forward to it and very thankful for everybody who has joined on the panel today Absolutely. for our uh, Leading Through Remote Learning. Yes. And you're seeing Jay on the screen as well. Hello, Jay. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. We're super excited to have, I mean, Rochelle, we have an all-star cast here today. Whenever I, I was, you know, reaching out, I was like crossing fingers that everyone could join and everyone said yes. So I'm just like super lucky that we were able to get all of these remarkable leaders in a, at one time. Yeah, definitely. And addi additionally, we have a, a variety, a kind of a diverse set of experiences here. We have, you know, superintendents, assistant superintendents, we have principals, we have a district librarian. We have all types of leadership roles represented today, which will really give us a unique perspective for our panel discussion. So let's talk about what our primary objective is for today. It is to include unique perspectives and voices so we can explore how to effectively lead and support educators during remote learning. It's so important because, you know, Rochelle, I have seen so many different distance learning plans. I've seen so many um, different resources and it can get really frustrating as an educator to know what's the best next step and how can I be supportive? Right, yeah, it was over, I mean, for anybody, no matter what experience you had, I mean, overwhelming. And so it's nice to have all of these people here to talk and to share experiences. And I hope that people will drop some comments and their experiences and questions yes. in the chat too. Yes, so I will give the, the framework for how this hour long discussion will happen. We have eight leaders who are going to serve as panelists here for our questions. Uh, Rochelle and I will be moderating, so we'll be taking turns asking questions. Um, and the way this platform works is that we will invite the panelist who is answering the question on at the time. And so Jay's is our first lucky panelist today. So he's, <laughs> he's gonna answer the first question. And we will have a time at the very end for questions and answers, open Q&A. So feel free to, you can either click the ask a question button uh, on the screen, or you can type your question in the chat. Some of the questions, obviously we have you know, we had 542 people register for today. So uh, we uh, will not get to every question. We will do our best to uh, find the question that's going to resonate. And uh, I'm sure obviously our panelists will answer some of the questions you already have. So that is going to be the framework for today. All so right. Michelle, I will hand it off to you now. Okay, so our first question is, and you can think about this for yourself as well, um, what are the top three things that are occupying your time during remote learning? And we'll be kicking it off with Jay, and I will just say there are a lot of things um, occupying my time, so I'm really interested to hear all of your experiences on this panel and also to see what you add, uh, everybody who's joining in in the chat. So Jay, we'll kick it off with you. Okay, well, th and again, thank you for having me today. Um, my top three things, besides, like you say, putting out fires as emails come and everything like that. Um, the first one, and, and more so to really start, but now just kind of maintaining connections. Uh, I feel like, um, you know, whether it's through Zoom meetings or these Google Meets or whatever, um, having my staff, my stu meeting with the students and meeting with the, the families, I've been trying to connect with them, whether, like I said, whether it's through that, through phone calls, I try to make a few phone calls every day to check on families and just um, do that. So like at the beginning, it was a little different, but now that we're kind of in, in it for a while, it's just make, making sure that I continue to maintain those connections. Um, the second piece is um, as things change, providing information, trying to be transparent and sharing the information um, as it comes out from the state or from the local district and continue, continue and do, doing that. Um, trying to talk teachers and, and parents off the ledge sometimes to to make sure that they understand that that you know we're giving grace just you know do the best you can and we're doing the best we can and and doing that so it's kind of maintaining those connections and the third thing is really um as we start moving forward developing our plan for the future and that's kind of an ongoing thing that's going to probably go on for for a long time looking at what other countries and other states are doing as they reopen 
but also coming up with multiple plans uh, to figure out what the summer is going to look like and then look, figure out what the next year is going to look like as we move forward and really working district wide, but also state and like I said, paying attention to what every, everyone else is doing. I feel like um, there's so many different scenarios that we, we need to consider and continuing to keep track of all the ideas and answers and doing that. So really look like learning as I go to, uh, you know, watching webinars, seeing what other people are doing and then keeping track of that so that I can share with the rest of our district. So those are my three. Yeah, that's awesome. great. Yeah, hey, Jay, I really, it resonated whenever you're talking about there's so many different plans out there right now because there really are, there, there's so many different ways and ideas. And I think through this, we have to be flexible. We have to ensure that whatever the plans we develop, uh, Rochelle, that it's going to include uh, ideation and the ability to kind of pivot. Yeah, agree. I mean, flexibility is key. And, and I love so much of what Jay says. I mean, focusing on all of those things we need to have in place and being open to all of the different possibilities that can happen. But at the same time, giving ourselves ourselves grace because we are learning as we go, which is a motto that I live by like all the time. So yeah. um, great to hear from Jay. So I guess we will switch over to hear from Jen to see, you know, Jen, what are the top three things that are occupying your time during this whole experience with remote learning, remote teaching? Hi, everyone. I, I first want to say thank you for inviting a teacher leader to the panel, um, because I think that whether you're a teacher librarian, a teacher on special assignment, a library media specialist, we're really recognizing the role as leader that we play as leaders. So my time has been spent three places, supporting teachers, supporting students, and really supporting my family. Um, I have been really trying to find the right resource for the right teacher to give at the right time. That's been quite the balancing act, right? You don't want to overwhelm teachers, but there are so many teachers who it would never have imagined that they would have had to teach remotely. Um, so providing them with tools, but also ideas for how to continue to maintain those relationships and connections that Jay was talking about our students have felt such an immense loss. So really in my role as, you know, a student council, uh, you know, advisor, how are we reimagining student appreciation weeks or, you know, virtual prom, working alongside administrators to be able to make sure that kids don't just think of school as this building, um, that they continue to feel like it's a community. And that has taken up so much of my time, but it's also feeding my soul. So I love it. And then finally, making sure it's such a tough balance between, uh, you know, when does your workday end? When you're now working from home, those lines blur, right? Family, you know, a, a student might be emailing me or a teacher might be emailing me late at night. Like, how do you make sure that you keep a balance, but also keep yourself well enough for your own family? Um, so those are my three. That's awesome. Well, uh, Jennifer Sine just gave you a, a shout out just now. She said, if you work with kids, you are a leader. Teachers have more direct leadership impact on students than you know campus leaders do. So uh, we certainly value the perspectives that you bring. Absolutely. And so we will then invite Neil to come and join us and share uh, top three things. And again, like when Jen's talking, we do have so many responsibilities, but we have to make sure we're you know, taking care of ourselves and our families too, so that we can bring our best selves to those that we, that we are leading and working with. Hello, Neil. How you doing? Hey, hey. how are you? Great, great. All right. So we'd love to hear what are the things that are the top three things that are occupying your time right now? Yeah, so I, I serve as the director of secondary education in a, in a public school district, and so overseeing middle schools and high schools. So um, just like any other time of the year for the spring, we've got one foot in this current year, and we've got one foot going into next year. So um, it just looks a little different um, as we, we look at this year. Um, it's still grades and graduation and, and some of those things that we have to think about. Um, so, you know, what does the grading scale look like has been a, a big part of it. We've got actually last day of school today. Um, graduation, uh, we've moved to virtual graduation. And so putting ourselves in that in that place of, of what does that look like? Um, our district has a, a, a theme each year. And this year, the theme is how you do anything means everything. And so when you think about it, it is, and, and um, Jennifer exactly said that, that, you know, it's not just about, you know, collecting books and, and dropping off diplomas, but it's also how we help make people feel 
Um, what I got to find in, in our car pickups uh, and drop-offs this week was parents needed that time for, for closure in a sense and celebration. Our, our, our staff needed that also. And so providing those opportunities and helping them to do that. Um, the, the, the next one is that next foot in the other year as far as what does school look like next year. Um, it was interesting that Jay talked about the idea about, um, and, and so did you as far as um, the, the flexibility that's needed. Mm -hmm. So we don't create just one silver bullet plan going into next year, but how do we create flexible plans that even what starts on, on the first day of school may not be what it looks like on the fifth day of school or the 10th day of school. So how do we create different scenarios for different opportunities? The third one Jay also talked about, um, I get to teach a class. Um, as a district administrator, I teach a, a blended learning class. And so it is about, about checking in on our students and our staff and not just that, that casual, how are you doing for a second and moving on, but really spending some time. So our, our meetings um, sometimes take a little bit more time, but in a good way, just to check on them. Um, people had said that COVID-19 is like grief. It, it is a sense of loss and how we help people process through that's important. And um, so checking in on them from a, a social emotional standpoint, a physical standpoint um, is important for, again, not just our students, but our staff. So those are my three. Awesome. Yeah. Um, really, really great points that Neil made, especially the social emotional learning connections. Yeah, I agree. That's a, a piece that is super important, especially because when we think about the things that we're teaching, I mean, as teachers or as leaders, what we want, what would normally be done at this period of time, we have to think about the things that our students and our colleagues are, and that we're missing out on. And we can make up for the content that we didn't cover. We can't make up for those opportunities to interact and be there to support our students, our colleagues and their families as well. So, all right. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Good. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Good. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you. And um Love to hear. Uh, <laughs> what's occupying your time? What are the top three? Well, famous name is Cookies. Does that count? That should count. That should <laughs> definitely does. count. It does. If you it can share them. <laughs> so the, yeah, you can't share them. They just <laughs> end up falling away somewhere. I don't know where that, where that, what's happening. But anyway, so I think one of the most important things for us is making sure that the three things that we've been doing are consistent in that in that capacity. The first one is we want to make sure that we ask the right questions. We spent the first three days of this whole process not talking about what curriculum was going to be delivered and everything like that. We talked. We had our our, our teachers just say you call every student you call every family and you ask two questions how are you doing and do you need anything that's where we start all of our days to make sure that that, that that's at the heart of what we do and I think that's a really important component of what we do because if we're in that spot we find ourselves in a place that we can celebrate kids the way that they're supposed to be celebrated and families who didn't choose to be here, right? Let's be clear about that. They didn't choose this. And all of a sudden now they're de facto teachers. Well, we, this is a chance for us to lean into families and say, not to say, Hey, you know, we told you our job is really, really hard. This is a time for us to lean in and say, we're here for you. This is our job is to help you. So that's the first thing is asking the right questions. The second thing is making sure that you continue the connections when it comes to the work, because I think what ends up happening with this process is two things bubble to the surface immediately when this whole thing broke, right? The two things that came up right away were how well do we know our kids and what are we willing to do for them when they're gone, right? Because how well we knew our kids knew what we they needed. They needed food. They needed hotspots. They needed connections. They needed some love, right? And what are we willing to do for them from them when they're gone is what are we making sure that we continue to give them on a daily basis? And the last thing that I try to start and that I that I've done or that's occupying my time is making sure that I start and end my day with joy, right? And there's got to be an end to the day at some point. But I start and end the day with joy. I always start my day reading stories to kids on Facebook Live and doing these really awful, ridiculous magic tricks that Sine still hasn't figured out yet. But that's okay. We can talk about that later. We <laughs> always I start out with these with these magic tricks and I do these awful magic tricks. And then what ends up happening is as soon as I'm done with the magic trick and the story, I end up getting calls from kids, right, or texts from kids going, you know, you're not magic. You're not magic. I saw the string. I saw those cards. Those are not real cards. Those are not. You're not magic. And then I'll go back and forth with these kids and I'll say, yeah, I am. I'm totally magic. I'm totally magic. And they're like, no, you're not. And I'm like, yeah, I am. They're like, no, you're not. I'm like, yeah, I am. And I'm like, well, you're going to have to come back tomorrow then. You're going to have to come back tomorrow at 8 o'clock to figure it out. And then they come back the next day, right? So we start and we always, I always end my day by calling the kids who have birthdays that day. Because I know that that's the end to my day, and I can walk in and be the you know be the husband, be the be the dad when I get home because I've closed the day and and, and left my day on a really high note. Joe, you always have such a tremendous energy, and we mm -hmm. love the way that you connect with kids and with families, and and love the point you made about you know the families didn't choose this, and it's about 
how we respond about how we're connecting with our kids. Uh, oh, so powerful. Yeah, and I, I have I have seen some of his magic tricks and I, I do believe he is in fact magic. So somebody wanted to see a magic trick, so maybe later. Uh, yeah, great. So, okay. Yeah, Joe, you're on the spot, so. I know, okay. And so welcoming Rosa, great Hello. to have you. Um, love to hear from you. Like what are the top three things occupying your time right now? Well, first of all, I want a cup of Joe uh, <laughs> because his energy is contagious and I'm yeah. gonna do my best. Um, he's got me excited. Right. Uh, three things that are really occupying my time and, and space in my brain are um, leading, learning, and caring. So leading now, um, I'm working remotely. I'm working from home for the most part, uh, but I spend most of my time with my team uh, just figuring out details, the small details, the very important technical pieces. How do we close out the year? What are we doing about graduation? All of the pieces that our families and our staff and students are actually grieving right now. It's a really difficult time. And so as a leader, um, we have to be on our A game and we have to uh, take all of those pieces into consideration when we're developing next steps for our communities, our learning communities. The other piece is learning. I feel a great deal of responsibility as a district leader uh, to be informed and to work and deal with facts. Um, it's a scary time, not only because of uh, the fears about COVID, but everything that we know as normal and that our kids and families know as normal are have changed. And when you add to that uh, food insecurity, job insecurity, it, it, it's tough. So as a leader, I have to be focused on being the most informed, empathetic, and aware leader possible. So I'm reading, I'm learning from my PLN and uh, trying to collaborate as much with other leaders. And the last part really is, um, you know, the caring piece, a really important piece and caring for self and caring for my families. We're going through the same things that our, our students and our school communities are experiencing. So it's really important that we keep that in mind and that we continue to care for self and care for them. Yeah, absolutely agree. And, and you know, Rosa is a dear friend, and so I know how much she cares about the families in her community and the kids in her community. And I also really like what she said about you know using data, you know, as uh, in fact, you know, as as leaders, we do that instructionally. So we have to continue mm -hmm. to do that during this time and be a support. And speaking right. of support, we have just amazing comments happening here on the side of, and this inspiration, and I'm. Like I'm getting even like emotional, like looking at some of the things that are in the chat right now about what people are, are experiencing and, and it's such a, a challenging time. So, um, and we, we all feel that together. Yes. All right, so we have Sine on and she is our next panelist for our very next question. So we have question two and the question is, how can we empower faculty and staff during this time? What do you think Sine? First of all, thanks for doing this. This has really just energized me. And, you know, we were all thrown into this um, current situation. We have no playbook, we have no structures, we have no systems, no examples, no time to try or to test. And um, where we are right now, we're all in this together. And I don't think anyone has a leg up on anybody on how you should do this and how it should be done. And so, you know, Todd Whitaker says it's people, not programs that make the difference in schools. And right now, that's what's making this thing happen. Um, and so people coming together, sharing ideas, not just ideas within your own school community or your districts, but I mean, right here, we have over 500 people here learning and growing together and trying to figure this thing out. And so three things that I think are critically important to empowering staff and faculty during this time is giving the space and the structured time to create, to think, to ideate, to uh, push back on different ideas, to try to figure out what is best for our kids, what's best for our community. I think we're all stressed right now because what we know, as Rosa said, to be normal is no longer that. And I don't think it's going to be ever the way it was 
before COVID. And so we knew we had a system that worked for some kids, but not all kids. And so how do we get beyond? We know that there's some gaps and things that need to be uh, corrected and we need to provide some different supports. And so the time and space to think through those things and then calling on others to lead. Um, as the principal, I've, I've been a principal for quite some time. And usually most things are pretty typical in a school year. There's a problem, there's usually a solution. Um, and you don't have that anymore. There are lots of problems and no solutions. And so who are the other people that can help you do the heavy lifting? Who are the other people that can lead? Where are other people um, thriving when um, in this current setting, they are well equipped to lead the way. So calling on those people and giving them the opportunity to lead. And then being able to say these three things. I don't know and be okay with that. Can you help me? And most importantly, thank you. And so by using those simple phrases, we're coming together, we're building tighter um, relationships and making really uh, great decisions. And we are reimagining school in the 21st century because we have to, and we gotta move. So um, we need everybody um, to really put their best thinking cap on so that we can make um, reimagine what it looks like for our kids and teachers. Oh, we sure do. And I sure want Sine like in my own PLN <laughs> to push me because uh, yeah. she's fantastic. And I had to write some things that she was talking about in the chat there because those are really important um, things to think about whenever we're working with our staff and our faculty about how we can help them, how we can truly be there for them. Right. And I think it's so important um, in the past. I mean, a lot of people, you might be afraid to ask for help because it shows vulnerability. But that is a huge I mean, right now we're all working through this. You know, every day it's a challenge and we have struggles. And so we need to speak up because we have to share our experiences, and our stories. So absolutely. Yeah. We sure do. And hey, Bethany, we have her on next. So excited to have you here. Um, how can we empower faculty and staff during this time? All right, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I've been like taking so many notes. I'm writing <laughs> everywhere because there's yeah. so much greatness here. Um, this this question, um, I have been thinking over it the last few days. And you know, one of the best ways I feel like we can empower our staff is to um, remind them that they're really in charge of their learning. And right now, there are so many resources out there and a lot of things are being thrown at us. And so um, it's, there's no better time to personalize adult learning. Um, and, and so what I have been talking to teachers about a lot is um, to know what is quality, you know, to be able to talk through um, what is really a quality piece of learning versus maybe more of a sales pitch and things like that, because we're getting flooded with emails and, um, and things like that. But one of the biggest things to me is to is to um, reiterate the fact that it's OK to be vulnerable and to admit that we do have a lot to learn right now, because um, probably when we start back, if you know, whenever that may be, things are going to look different and we're going to need each other. And so that power of collaboration mm -hmm. um, between teachers, even within a district that are the same grade level or beyond um, through the state or through the country or even internationally, that those those communication ways can continue. And um, we have time to embed into our days for that type of collaboration. It doesn't have to be face to face to be powerful. And we all know that those face to face learning times are, are you know, truly the best. But look at all the learning that's happening here right now. It's incredible. And so I think with teachers being vulnerable, admitting they don't they don't know or that they're scared, you know, and then having that shared um, feeling of uncertainty can help drive us all forward, you know, for, for new learning. So, <laughs> so exciting. Yes. Well, you know, Bethany is another dear friend and I know how much she loves the in-person. She misses her kids so much. And for her to say that I know means a lot because she really values those in-person relationships and having that kind of face-to-face -face interaction with her kiddos. Yeah, me too. That's one I, one of the nice things about technology is being able to connect like this with other educators and with my students. And so, yeah, I totally agree. And hello, Beth. Beth, hello. Hey, hey, hey everybody. Good to see you. Good to see you. How, Thanks so much for having me. Yes. How can we empower faculty and staff during this time? 
Well, I think first of all, um, it all is that foundation of trust. So even though we're virtual, how are we continuing to build trust and sustain trust and maintain trust with those that we serve, the adults that we serve? And so first of all, really listening, are we making sure that we take time to listen and specifically feedback? Are we getting feedback from staff throughout the whole time that we're there? Um, our first, last day of school is tomorrow, and then we have our virtual PD day on Friday. And that's one thing we are intentionally doing is, what are your ideas? What are you worried about? Um, what are things you're really thinking about for the fall? So making sure that you're taking time to listen and get feedback and then also supporting. How are we taking time to support our staff? And I think that this is something that no matter what the fall looks like, we've got to continue to do this. We have to be intentional on seeing what our teachers, our paras, our nurses, what do you need and how can I help you? And I think that's the thing that has made a big difference for me is I, I've tried really hard to build a culture of wellness within our building, but I think we always focus on kids, which they're our primary client for sure. But in order for our kids to be well taken care of, we've got to make sure that our staff is well taken care of as well. So informal check-ins are huge. Um, I go through my phone and just look at the names and see who haven't I talked to lately and shoot a text or give a phone call. I also have a specific form that I send out usually every other week. Just let me know what you need. How can I help? And then also, which is kind of a um, resonating theme, is ask people to help me. And I have so many folks today, we have um, students right now picking up their belongings, but I had two teachers that said, can I please do that? I miss school so much. Can I please be in charge of that? Sure thing. <laughs> so I think sometimes as leaders, we try to take care of everything for everyone all the time when we don't realize that we really can empower others by giving away some of that leadership and really building the leadership in others. So I think those are, are huge. But And then finally, with that support too, how can we create systems that help make our teachers' jobs easier. Our teachers shouldn't have to be worrying about all the technical little things like that. How can we be roadblock removers for our staff so all their creativity is going into building relationships with kids and then also creating lessons that are powerful and inspiring and you know just building those relationships. So those are those are kind of my thoughts around that question. Oh, fantastic. I, I think all of us wish that Beth was our principal because she is the kind of leader that inspires me and empowers me to you know jump in and lead and i think she is someone who i'm sure her building is just full of teacher leaders because how she empowers yeah and i love the roadblock removers yes. <laughs> as well right <laughs> yeah definitely need some of those hey neil welcome yeah thanks for being on yeah this is great yes so how can we empower our faculty and staff during this time so, you know, Sine talked uh, a little bit a while ago about um, ideation, and, and that's kind of how my mind thinks is through a design thinking model, um, these design thinking principles. And, you know, some of it really talks about the idea of empathy to begin with. You know, I have a title that is a district office administrator, but I know that me sitting in my office by myself making up things isn't isn't what's best for the school district at all. And, um, you know, any any attempt that I think I have in either knowing it all or trying to do it all by myself needs to go out the door. And um, so empowering them is this idea of really asking them. And, and Beth talked about that. You know, um, people are itching to help. We've got we've got parents that want to help. We've got staff members that want to help. They know their job roles the best. And really, it's just creating an environment. I look at my role as creating the environment uh, to gather people together to facilitate the questions and then to step back and let them lead and let them um, come up with what the answer should be. Um, so I think it's just priming the pump and getting them to think flexibly, getting them to think about adaptability, encouraging them, um, allowing, especially through the Zoom meetings, um, that there are people that may not be talking and getting them to say, hey, you haven't shared in a while. Because you know sometimes our introverts that maybe aren't the first to jump in are the ones that have the best ideas. So um, making sure that we've got the right people at the table and then, and then allowing them to do their things. Um, so we have created some design challenges that have said things like, if we reopen next year, what does our cafeteria look like in serving food? And I want you guys to come up with those ideas and I want you to do it in a short amount of time and just, and really just not, not necessarily to come to the silver bullet answer, but get them to start thinking differently and getting them to kind of be in that box in place. Um, like letting our teachers think about, you know, how we're going to recover or cover learning that's going to happen in the fall. We can't assume that all, all of our, our lessons were taught this year to that same fidelity that we've done in the past, giving them, number one, permission to be able to do that, but then giving them a space, and Beth talked about that, through surveys and, and audits to say what didn't get covered, and it's okay 
what, how can we um, look at that instruction that's going to happen in the fall? So a lot of it has to be given back in the hands of everybody else and create that environment to help others to share. Fascinating. I, you know, I didn't think of uh, in terms of design challenges. We do so much planning for, you know, project-based learning and design challenges for our students, but to make this a meaningful experience uh, with the pandemic and, and creating these design challenges for remote learning, I think is uh, it's a remarkable idea. Yeah, it's definitely a good time to take those opportunities to do that too, especially at this time of the year as well. And yes. he's back. <laughs> he's back. Yes. You're the last one on this question, and you're the you're the first panelist for the next question, so you get to hang out for a few minutes. Okay, that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. So for this question, though, how can we empower faculty and staff during this time? Well, again, I I, I agree with what, what all the other people said before me. Um, no one, no one chose to be here. We didn't choose to be here. Our families didn't choose to be here. Our teachers didn't choose to be here. Um, so so the first part about empowering our faculty and staff, as Beth said, is the trust piece. Um, I think that was developed well before this all happened. I hope it was developed well before before this all happened. Um, that uh, that our staff was empowered to take risks, try things differently, and then this just caused some of the things that we were hoping to happen to speed up. So I feel like um, that that trust piece, that the idea that it's okay to innovate and try new things and share ideas, and then. For me, I think part of the thing that I do is like I, you know, I cheer for them. I, I cheer for the cheer for the staff when they do things. I make sure that that they're recognized um, when we have staff meetings. That's the first thing we start with, even in the Zoom, is that you know the recognition of the great things that are going on around us, and people listen and they watch and then they try and they tweak and they and they move forward. So I I think that, and then the, the final thing is just really to to. Um, continue to find ways to inspire. Um, this has been a long time. This has basically been the length of our summer, our yeah. summer break. And we still have, in New Jersey, we still have seven more weeks, eight more weeks almost to, to go. So we, you know, to kind of keep trying to find ways to inspire them, to step forward and do new things continually so it doesn't get old for the students or the staff. Um, and and that's, what, that's what I, you know, been trying to do. That's what this is doing right here as yeah. we talk. Um, so we just have to give grace, as we said before, and show our gratitude continually. Absolutely. I think we're all in this together. And it's, we have to, sometimes we, we lose uh, track of that. We, we get in this kind of mindset that it's a time oriented. We have to hurry up to rush. And, um, but to also realize that we're all in this together. All right. Michelle, oh. question three. I, I, I'm already realizing, like, I wish this was an all day event now because. I know. Goodness, we have so many comments right now talking about the, the lessons that everyone's learning right now. So this is just phenomenal. Yeah, it's great to see what's being shared in the chat as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, make sure you drop in your Twitter handle or questions, yes. of course. So here we go with question number three. Uh, Going to start with you, Jay. Uh, what is the important, the most important lesson that you have learned during remote learning and how will this impact your planning for instruction for next year? Well, it's, it's a lesson that we kind of already were starting to work on, um, but we know that, that there are equity issues in society and in schools. And um, it, it just really has hit me that the importance, and I, I wrote a little blog about this, the importance of um, continually trying to find ways to um, make school more equitable. Um, as we try to impact society, uh, I, I think that um, you know we we are we support our kids in so many ways, and when they walk through the doors, we're able to give them a lot of the things that they need. But now that they're not coming through those doors every day, it's become very apparent that there's still a lot of work to be done. So the, the most important lesson I said is that we continue to find ways to to give our students and their families access to um, everything. You know, we, we, as Joe and them were talking about, we feed them, we provide them the social, as, social and emotional support. We keep them safe in a lot of ways. And it, it's become very clear that our schools are an important part of that and we need to continue to find ways that. So the most important lesson is to continue to find ways to make our schools as well as the world more equitable. Oh, completely agree. 
Absolutely and, agree. You know, I think the Maslow hi hierarchy of needs just doesn't stop because we're in remote learning. You know, that, if that is the way that we uh, work and believe in the brick and mortar world, then well, why would it be any different now with remote learning? I think it's even more so now. Yeah, and I think, I mean, for me, just listening to Jay, and I, I'm anticipating the other responses too, is I know that I've become more aware of the needs of my students and their families, and that's something that I really wanna focus on, making sure that I understand that um, always. So, okay, so Beth, uh, on to you. So what is the most important lesson that you've learned during remote learning, and how is that going to impact your planning for next year? I think the, the first thing that's really been the most important is the importance of the partnerships with our families. I think that sometimes we we just kind of sit back and say, hey, we've got this education thing. Don't worry about it. You you go ahead. Don't worry about it. And especially as we move into the secondary world, as an elementary principal, I used to, you know, I think we did a lot more family nights, a lot more of ways of interacting our parents with our curriculum. And then once I moved to middle school, I felt kind of like we stopped doing that more. So how can we make it again? I'm going to use the word intentional because, again, we have to come back to that. What, what we focus on gets done. How can we intentionally um bring our parents to the table, not when there's just a pandemic. I think that that's something, the partnership there with our families, we definitely, we need to strengthen. I know for me in my own specific situation. And I, I think the other piece though, again, is is back to the relationships. And I hope this is a theme that I, I know everyone, I knew Jay was gonna talk about equity. Um, so I, I kind of went a, a different direction, but social emotional learning has become a buzzword, but it needs to be happening completely. And I think that that's going to be our biggest focus when we come back. We have to make sure we've all gone through a collective trauma together. And I know it's affected all of us differently, but we have to make sure that we take care of each other, of ourselves, and figure out how do we embed that in everything that we're doing as we we come back. So I think also that um, kind of in closing, like, it's okay to hit the pause button. It's okay to know we don't know exactly and to take a little time to get there. Um, I think I, I watched lots of districts do this and I was, I'm blessed to work for a district that really we, we slowed down to speed up. Um, the one thing we don't want to happen is that the decisions that we make actually make it harder for people. So how can we really slow down, reflect, get that feedback so that when we come back, that we come back stronger? Yeah, I mean, dropping the goodness of with the Roblox again, I think that's one of the things I'm hearing the most as far as leadership principles is how can we eliminate those roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So next we have Joe coming back for Joe's coming back on. <laughs> Joe's coming back on. Gotta get ready for Joe. Yes. <laughs> Bring in the energy and maybe the magic yeah. tricks. All right. There okay, here we go. Right. So oh, Joe. 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 Yes. Back. Oh yep. good. So so here's the thing like so I'm just having some of my <laughs> Water, what I really understand is that yeah, well, you guys want a magic trick and everything. I just have this cup right here. I'm just, this cup right here. And if I concentrate hard enough, maybe I can just, oh my goodness, is it floating? Is it, it's floating. It's absolutely floating. That's just what it does. All right. So here's the thing that we need to understand about when, when we, when we go back into this process, the thing that really that I've learned the most, honestly, is that First of all, we try to teach way too much. Let's let's let let's put that to the side, right? Like we try to teach way too much. Like there, without question, we try to teach way too much. The second thing that I've learned and un to understand is that the impact of the teacher has never been more evident than it is right now. You know, and I think one of the things that we've tried to message with our families is 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 saying this out loud. This is not ideal. This is not ideal at all. Ideal is your kids with us and their and their peers in the room together, learning together. That's ideal. This is not ideal. We're going to do the best we can in this situation, but this is not ideal. Let's be very clear about that. Because when we say that, it gives value to what we do here. We want to make sure that there's always value in what we do here. So we keep coming back to what that really looks like. And the last thing that I think I've learned is that the impact of colleagues is truly important. Think about that. If you have, you're here at school and your colleague, you're having a struggle or you need to talk about something, you walk next door to your colleague and you have a conversation and they have a pretty good indication of what's going on because they've seen these kids or been in this situation. All of our teachers now are in a place where their colleagues have completely changed. Their colleagues are three years old, five years old, 10 years old. They're back from college. They're doing their own work. Some of them need a diaper change. That's what the colleagues have turned into at this point. And until we recognize that they're doing not only working with those colleagues, but also trying to teach other people's kids, then we're going to find ourselves in a position where we're putting too much on our people. 
So the more that we can connect with them and just to understand that we're all doing the best we can. And the impact really comes down to the connection on a, on a daily basis. How are we making sure that we go back to those two questions, right? What, what, how well do we know our kids and what are we willing to do for them when they're gone? And, and in doing that and keep coming back to that core, that's going to drive us into next year because those two things should never change. How well do we know our kids and what are we willing to do for them when they're not here? Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. That oh, was uh, so much goodness. Gets you like pumped, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's especially when he talks about, you know, truly connecting because connecting goes more than just, you know, how are you doing? It's listening. It's, it's empathy. It's actually putting yourself in another person's shoes and thinking about what's happening in their world. And again, how can I be a support? Right. And I, I love what he said about your colleagues and who your colleagues are now in our spaces yeah. that have become our homes and work. Yeah. So, OK, Rosa, welcome back. Um, what is the most important lesson that you have learned and how is that going to impact your instruction for next year? Um, I can't believe I'm after Joe again. Um, <laughs> I don't have a magic trick, but um, yes. I am drinking my coffee. Um, what I've learned that that is really impacting what I'm doing on a day to day and will do in our planning is that crisis leadership is hard. Um, it, we understand that leading, whether you're leading from the classroom, leading a school, leading a district or a nation, it's tough. And everything depends on the leadership that is happening. Um, the second thing that uh, is part of that is that we have to go back and remember the things that were important prior to COVID and school closures and distance learning are still important. And one of those very important things are people first. Everything that we do should be with that mindset and how uh, these decisions are directly impacting our, our, our staff and our teachers and our families. Um, this includes uh, communication, this includes resources that we're investing, whether they're human resources or fiscal resources. This includes um, the equity piece that I'm going to talk about as my third bullet under crisis leadership is hard. Um, inequity has been there. And if you know anything about me, you know I'm very passionate about uh, this topic of equity. And um, unfortunately, with the COVID, it has really um, created a larger issue. Uh, for some, it took this pandemic to understand how bias and, and racism and um, all of these pieces are impacting our students. Um, now we can't hide from it. It, it must be addressed. Um, the pandemic didn't magically um, help us uh, eradicate or magically disappear uh, the bias and inequity that many of our communities have faced for a long time. And so uh, we have to be super intentional as we are planning for the fall and understanding that inequity comes in many shapes and forms, not only in the distance learning opportunities that we're giving to our families, but in just what home looks like, the resources that are available um, in um, our healthcare system, um, our students who may or may not need additional mental health support. And that's, that goes across, um, across all uh, areas. So not uh, just impacting students or families in poverty, but impacting everyone. And so the big lesson is crisis leadership is hard and uh, we have to keep in mind people first. We have to keep in mind creating equitable systems. And we have to remember that everybody's a leader and we, it's gonna take all of us to plan the best fall session for students uh, that we can possibly have. Oh, so much goodness. You definitely struck a chord, Rosa, with the, the chat because everyone is right there with you with inequity and, and you're exactly right. I mean, the social implications are huge during this time. Mm -hmm. And I love that she says like people first. And yeah. that, that's kind of you know a theme that's been throughout all of the answers is focusing on relationships, communication, the families uh, and, and supporting one another. Yeah. Okay, welcome back, Bethany. Um, so hey. love to hear from you. What is the most important lesson that you've learned during this time and how is that going to impact your instruction and your planning for next year? 
Um, first of all, echo everything that everyone else said. It's hard to be last on this question, <laughs> for sure. Um, but, you know, the equity piece is glaring, of course. And um, everything that Rosa just said, I, I just, you know, echo that. Um, but something that I have really honed in on is um, the need for our students to have a voice in all of this. Because, um, you know, I, I know we've, we've, we've tried to cater to families as a whole. And, and, and make sure that they have the right access and the right technology and tools that they need. But um, I think, you know, something that I have not focused on as much is actually asking students what they feel is working and not working. And so, um, and also finding out ahead of time what people have access to, you know, um, we sort of reacted to that after we shut down. We had to we had to find out who, you know, had what type of access in their homes, how many devices, um, solid Wi-Fi, things like that. And so we really should have known that ahead of time. We should have been able to, you know, have that kind of information from our families. And so now that we, um, you know, have learned from that experience, that's something that we can go into a new year trying to learn up front. You know, how can we support and then another thing with um, just back to the equity issue is our kids with special needs um, and who receive special services like therapies. Um, I, I know that um, those kids are not getting what they need, you know, at this time. And, um, you know, a lot of that is an equity issue, but a lot of it is just the, the personal factor involved between a physical therapist and her student or patient or a speech language pathologist and um, her, her patient. And so, um, you know, how do we how do we leverage all of our resources to ensure that those students who have um, IEPs are getting their needs met both academically, but also physically and socially, and emotionally as well. And, and so that's like a beast. And it's something that I know we will figure out overnight. And it's going to take a lot of, um, you know, trial and error and a lot of intentionality as well on looking and seeing through the lens of those families and through the lens of those children who may not be able to advocate for themselves on what is best for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love that you mentioned, um, you bring up, you know, special needs and special education. And one thing, and I can drop this in the chat too, is that I recently came across um, the Educating All Learners Alliance, I believe. If anybody wants to check into that, it's a group of educators and different organizations that have come together to provide, you know, information about special education services and things that are out there. And they're aimed at, you know, equity and providing resources. So, uh, I'll drop that into the chat so everybody can check that out. Awesome. And it really is, Bethany highlights just a level of empathy that we really need. And, and just to truly, you know, connect their students and ask them, what do you need right now? And then be able to truly uh, meet that need. And at the, at the deepest levels, and she gave very personal examples of, of what kids need. So I appreciate the level of empathy Bethany has just shared. And we have our last question, uh, which is, is a wonderful way to, to kind of end today's um, webinar is, you know, looking at the role of a school leader. And I'm so happy that, that Jennifer is, is first in this because, you know, you have a unique perspective, you know, not holding a traditional building principal role right now. So how has the role of the school leader strengthened during the past three months? Thank you. And I, I'm so grateful that I'm first. And I'm so grateful to hear so many official administrators talk about teachers and the, the importance of shared leadership. Because if I have learned anything throughout all of this is I have recognized how integral my role is in helping to lead the school. This is not just about the administrators. Um, a school, the culture of the school, building relationships, showing compassion and empathy for colleagues, for students. This is our responsibility. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so we, this has shown me um, that, that we are all leaders, we really are. And so I'm grateful to the administrators who have already recognized this. For those who haven't, um, I think we need to keep pushing. We need to keep 
keep up the good fight. We know what's right. We we can see um, maybe some things that sometimes administrators can't see. So we just have to take it and, and run with it and, and really embrace uh, shared leadership and responsibility. Agreed. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, we really do. I mean, again, we are all in this together. And so we all have to kind of uh, think about, you know, how do my actions, my beliefs really play a role in, in leadership? And I think the role of the leader definitely has changed this past three months. I think for the better. I think right. um, we have an opportunity to change the leadership role for the better. Yeah, absolutely agree. All right, Neil's back. All right. What you got for us? Yeah, this is a great question. You know, yeah. it really comes down to this aspect again, and, and I, I shared it before that, you know, the, the titles and uh, Jennifer was spot on, especially at this time, but it's, it's been what it should have been all the time. Titles shouldn't matter. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that just because I have this title, I'm any smarter. Uh, there's no crystal ball to anything that we're doing. And uh, so I think what I've, I've really learned is just really how to lean on people and lean on our team, constant communication and with feedback loops it has to be in place. Um, so often I, I get into that routine of, well, we talked about that. But, you know, if we didn't get it to that end user and really spend some time really discussing it and having that parking lot conversation in our Zoom meeting, uh, we're in trouble. And so being able to read faces and really pausing and saying, look, we have to have real conversations. You have to push back. Um, we have to do that. Um, I think that that has kind of um, helped, I think, take down some of those barriers that we've had um, where people, I think, have felt afraid to, to speak back. And, and we've said, look, you have to do that because I'm not, I'm not able to pick up on the facial features and we don't have necessarily the time that's been going where we usually have a um, time in between to make decisions. Now it's sometimes only a minute before something changes. And so we have to be sure we're clear with each other. Um, but collaboration, I think, is also where we give people time and a place to go back and check with secretaries and school counselors and media specialists, just other people to make sure that we've got all the information we should before we make decisions. Um, the, the next one is this idea about um, not rushing into things that I've learned. I know the week leading up to our stay home order, um, I was working on things that, you know, four hours into working into something, I, I, I got done, I walked out the door and then uh, the governor or the president changed it all and it all went in the trash. And this idea about leadership sometimes is that you're, you, you're on the front line and you're going as fast as possible and moving and forging ahead. And sometimes leadership is about pausing and waiting and letting some things crystallize before we make decisions and, and pull the trigger. And I, I've learned how to um, make myself uh, to, to slow down and, and calm down through things and also make sure that we're doing that with other people, giving that permission to say, let's pause and wait and see how things go. So I'd say those are the two big things that we've I've come up with in, in uh, this short time of my leadership uh, strengths that have been, uh, I guess, growing through this. Um, thanks for sharing, Neil, because I, I think you're exactly right. I think that their role is continuing to strengthen and and grow. And I appreciate your you know transparency there of saying, you know, like, hey, I'm we're all growing together as leaders. Yeah, and I think it is definitely important to slow down, even though that is so hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> we do, we, do, we just want to keep, you know, now that it's remote learning and it's a distance learning, like we got to keep going, keep going, keep going. Right. And now more than ever, we have to take a breath. Yes, breathing and, is important. Yeah. <laughs> and invite Sinead in to talk about this uh, question. <laughs> so, what we are all up against is truly unprecedented. Um, and where you have situations where we have problems and there's a solution, and you can call someone and say, hey, I have this problem. What do you think I should do about it? And they can say, well, I've done this and um, or I've tried this. We don't have that. Now we're living in the world of dilemmas. We've all been thrown into this big, huge dilemma, which there's a difference between problems and dilemmas. Problems have solutions. Dilemmas, there are no solutions. You just have to figure out what works so that you can live with the problem. And so it's like we're a dilemma dancer and the music could change in the middle of, of the performance. And so you get really good at dancing to, um, you know, one type of music and then the DJ switches the music and you have to figure out how to make that work. Just as Neil just said, he had a, everything figured out and then 
it was like, no, we have to shift gears and change directions. And so during the time of a dilemma, people really look to the leader. You know, Rosa talked about crisis management and um, crisis leadership. It's completely different. And usually a crisis will last for a, a period of time and then you can move beyond. Well, I mean, who knows how long this is going to last? And so some of the skills that are really important include being really clear. Clarity is critical at this time. Um, saying, I don't know, I don't have an answer, um, but being able to provide that clarity and it lets your people know that, you know, I'm going to take the, have the courage to move us forward. I, I really don't know. The, this is this is where we are. This is where we need to be. And we need to figure out how we're going to get there. Um, so clarity is key and being candid, just being honest and saying what is, you know, what is truth? What these are the facts and this is what we know, even if it's difficult. And I think we're learning that um, we have had to say no to a lot of things that have always been our norm and being able to say that's just not going to happen is really hard. Um, and so but we have to be candid and be truthful so that we can begin to heal and move forward. And then I think being empathetic, um, being a connector, connecting your, connecting your staff, connecting to your staff, connecting with your students, connecting with your community um, is a critical um, leadership skill that, skill that definitely has been strengthened at this time. And just really rethinking um, what we are about um, in schools, what our mission is about, and that we're really on a mission that matters and that makes a difference. Um, so that may mean there were some things that we did that, but does it really matter now? Is it really impacting? Is it really making a difference? And so just really rethinking to make sure that the, the organization that you're leading or that you're a part of is really about the core work. Mm -hmm. So powerful. And also your dilemma dancer is now <laughs> done viral on the, the chat. <laughs> the yeah, chat. Michelle's going to make a TikTok with the uh, dilemma yeah. dance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can't dance there, but I definitely got the uh, I got the analogy for sure. <laughs> All right, we are bringing Beth on to answer next. Hey, Beth. Hey. hey. I'm just over here trying to think about all my dances that I know. Right. <laughs> I love that analogy because it's so true because when we only know the chicken dance and the Macarena, it's hard to like do a different dance to right. when it changes all the time. So I think that was such a great analogy. I love it. Yes. Awesome. Well, great to be back. I think probably for me with this question, the number one thing to me, I, I really thought about unity. Uh, we write mission statements. We write vision statements. We come up with collective commitments. We have our goals and we have all that, but we had to in this moment, come together and create a mission for getting through this. And I really feel like all of those things that we've done previous to this, there are some districts that rock the mission statement and living it and all of that. But I'm so proud of our district because at the very beginning, we said, what's our mission for getting through the next three months? Whether or not we have phase one or phase one B and phase, because you know, back in March, we didn't know that we weren't going to come back to school. And so I think really coming together with the other, I'm in a district with 2,300 kids, it's relatively small, but the six principals came together and said, here is our collective mission because we are serving our community and we can't have six different missions happening. Mm -hmm. And so our mission came to life that we were going to review, we were going to reinforce, we were going to enrich and build relationships throughout our time together. And anything that we would ask anyone else to do, if it doesn't align to that, then we're not doing it. And so really being crystal clear on what we were you know, going into, and that's something that can come, you know, no matter what is going on in the fall, we, we need to come together around a, a shared mission, that unity piece. I think the other thing um, about this that I've, I think it's strengthened leadership, but I also think it's been a roadblock for leaders. Sometimes we're addicted to our jobs. And I think that this pandemic like has really made us, we have to analyze how much are we working? Are we still going into work on the weekends? Because I, I see so many leaders, that's what they're doing 24 seven. How are we, we, we have to make sure that we're setting up some boundaries so that we can be healthy. And I think that um, those first few weeks, I never stopped until I would sleep. And then I would still dream about it and think about it in my sleep. And so really um, carving time for boundaries, whether, um, and again, I agree with everyone else. Leadership is, is definitely a verb to me. It's not a noun. Um, I, I have always identified as, a, as the oldest of five kids. I've been a, definitely a leader naturally, you know. So, um, but finally, um, I think the biggest thing that strengthened educators in general is we're making it happen. We don't need state tests 
to help us get through this. We don't need mandates from anyone. When there's a problem, educators figure out how to solve it. You know, and and that's what's awesome. That's what I think I have been so proud to watch happen all over the world. Um, we make it happen, and and I think that's the the state of education. While we've got a lot of things working against us right now, we're going to figure out how to take care of our kids, take care of the whole child. We're also going to take care of our teachers and our staff. And I think that's the that's the piece that keeps me going through all of this. Is I know I know that we definitely um, we can do this. We, we'll figure it out. Well, and a really good point, Beth, because we can't be our best selves unless we take care of ourselves. And there's a temptation to think, oh, if I do, you know, if I take a meeting at eight o'clock at night or if I work until midnight, then I'll be more prepared tomorrow. But that's simply not the case. We can't bring our best selves. Uh, so okay. really good point. I would actually want to keep you on because okay. um, we have uh, I want to make sure we have a chance to get to our uh, open Q&A. And uh, we'll have time for one question. I'm going to take the one with the most votes. And Rosa, don't worry, you're still on deck for um, to go last year after Beth. Um, so I'll still ask you the original question. But Beth, the, the most voted for question was around what strategies do you have for students who are not completing assignments online or have disappeared altogether? And disappeared as in like we can't find them right. online or anywhere. So one of the non-negotiables that we decided on as a district too is that we will make sure that we have contact with every student every week. And so that is something our staff does first. Like they try to, you know, they interact. We made the decision early on too, you know, our last day is tomorrow. We, we definitely aren't going into June like other districts may have to do. We knew there was no way that we could continue on trying to do the grading system the way. So we really um, are not collecting assignments to pass, if that makes sense. So for us, um, specifically as a school principal, what I've done is, I mean, I, I call, I go to their house, I, I figure out how can I get there? We did something, this is goofy, but that's, for those of you that know me, that's me. We went ahead and did a, I saw somebody, I think it was an Amber Tiemann's district that did um, like principal on wheels or something like that. So my assistant principal and I for teacher appreciation week, we threw that back to our, our parents and said, hey, you're teachers too. We want to appreciate you. If you need us, if you need to make a referral to the principal's office, we'll come to the house. We'll do something to embarrass your kid in a fun way, not anything that would be bad. We'll uh, do a silly dance to make them laugh, whatever. So the parents that maybe weren't real sure about things when I did that, I mean, we did that and then we come out to the house. Our teachers also nominated some kids that they needed help with. So that was the other thing we did. We are able to keep that contact when, again, it's been an intentional thing. Um, the teachers send a form. We also streamline it. I know somebody asked a little bit about roadblock removal. Well, one of the things we have a systematic way of checking in with kids. So we have our Google form that every single teacher uses on Friday, the advisory teacher first hour sends it to their first hour class and it's simple. So it's an easy way to, to get the kids to check in because at the end of the day, we just need to know they're okay. And that's what last week I hadn't heard from a parent in two weeks. And I said, I just, and I finally got a hold of them. And I know this is, I never want to do anything, but I mean, our, our police department, we want to become together as a community. It shouldn't be the school and our parents and the police. And we are all Fulton proud. That's what we try to work for here. And so we've had to do some well checks with law enforcement just to make sure that our kids are safe. So I think just going, maybe doing a little non-traditional and um, just calling and checking and, and texting and just keep trying no matter what. And also, we have to look at a little bit where um, we have to look a little bit at, you know, what are we asking kids to do? You know, my high school son, he's not I mean, some of the assignments that we're sending out, like what can we do to to maybe flip that a little bit to get to get kids a little more engaged? So that's just a little bit. And I know some people have lots a lot more kids that they have in their building, in their school buildings. And that's not always possible. I know that. I drive a route for food deliveries every Tuesday and Thursday, and I drive over 100 miles. So, I mean, we have those limitations as well. I think it's just figuring out, you know, picking up the phone has been huge for me. That's amazing. I love the no excuses yeah. that Beth is giving. Like, you know, we are going to connect with our kids and we are going to do anything possible to connect with them and, and meet them and, mm -hmm. um, and engage with them. So I, I I really, Beth, your inspiration to me um, to think about, you know, every possibility. And if something doesn't work, if there's a barrier, eliminate it, right? Right. And I love how she said, at the end of the day, we just need to know that the kids, that they're okay. And yeah. So finding whatever it is, whether it's traditional or not, just finding a way to check in. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We have Rosa here to um, 
end our discussion today, even though we're over time, hopefully people don't mm -hmm. mind and are able to stick around for a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll stay with the question four, and then I'll also ask you the, uh, the follow-up open Q&A, the one that Beth just answered. So uh, first, talk about the role of the leader and how it's been strengthened the past few months. Um, if you had any doubt that leadership mattered in an organization, um, I hope you don't have any more doubts. Uh, because people are looking to leaders uh, for guidance, for recommendations, for protocols, for support, uh, all of those pieces that have, as I mentioned earlier, always been important. Um, this has brought out the best in people and it has also been an awakening. Um, as a leader, I, I think uh, it has pushed us into new territory, uncharted territory. And uh, for many of us, we love the opportunity to be able to think out of the box and to bring resources together and to tap into the leadership of others. Um, someone mentioned earlier uh, that uh, this leadership is uh, shared leadership, and it is. If you think that you have the answers and that you are going to provide everything your district or your school or your classroom needs alone, um, you're wrong. Um, this uh, has strengthened leadership in a way that forced everybody to come together. So it definitely is about district uh, leadership. Um, you know, one thing I did notice, and I, I want to plug this, is that um, many of uh, the great leadership stories that we're hearing about are coming from women. And so I want to continue to foster and encourage um, women across all, all levels to, uh, to take opportunities to, to be a leader. Um, uh, the other piece that I wanted to say is uh, it's not a one person show. Um, what we need, uh, the expertise that is required to overcome these challenges and to really come back to a better system. Uh, we don't want to go back to the same system. We want to create a better system. And in order to do that, you've got to tap into the expertise of your teachers, of your staff, of your classified teams. And a very important one that we sometimes forget is our parents mm -hmm. and uh, what they have to contribute because this is a great opportunity to recreate what we had and to make it uh, much better and much stronger and much more equitable for our families. And thank you for being such a wonderful model for leadership. Mm -hmm. And you are so inspiring. And every time I hear you speak uh -huh. and, and share, it inspires me. So, so thank you. Thank you, Doc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us about the last question, the open Q&A. You know, we have kids who... Um, are not engaging or they're not completing assignments, strategies, how do you respond to that? Uh, very similar to Beth in, in reaching out. Um, our teachers have the tightest connections and relationships with our students, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in our district, our teachers are, are making contact with families. And if they're not, uh, after continued attempts, uh, connecting with families, then um, our principals are involved. Uh, in addition to that, our counselors and our uh, social workers are, are reaching out because when we think about students who are not connecting, it's usually for two reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is perhaps they're having a really hard time with the work mm -hmm. and they are not feeling successful. And the last thing they wanna do is feel like they're being pushed uh, or held accountable or, you know, called on a carpet for not doing something. And when you're a kid, you know, that's how you re rationalize things and, and figure, okay, if my teacher's reaching out, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble for not doing something. But the other reason I think um, some kids are, are falling off the radar is because they are dealing with um, adult issues. They're dealing with supporting siblings, supporting family, supporting a sick family member, taking on those shared um, responsibilities with parents. If parents are essential workers, if parents have to work 
in order to just stay afloat. And so uh, we, we've had um, students say, you know, I, I can't complete the assignments because I, I don't have the time. I'm taking care of home, I'm taking care of my siblings and um, just trying to survive and help my parents. So the social emotional piece uh, and um, the trauma really that is in inflicted on some of our students is something that we have to think about when we're wondering why kids aren't there. It's yeah. not that they're avoiding us uh, because they are on vacation. When you peel back the layers and dig a little deeper, you're realizing that there's more going on. And it's an opportunity for us to better support our families. Mm -hmm. And I think you made me just now realize, you know, it's, it's sometimes as teachers, we get maybe um, concerned or, or, you know, if a student doesn't respond to something. And I think you made me realize, you know, it's not about us. <laughs> you know, I, I'm so happy you use the word trauma because some of our students are going through trauma. And we have to realize it is not about us. It truly is about um, the conditions that our students are facing and how we can be there for them and empathize. So I appreciate your perspective and ins inspiration in regards to how we should be moving forward with uh, our students who have many, many needs. Absolutely. Thank you. You guys are a great team, by the way. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, so fun. So fun. We made us like, I wish we could continue on, but I know, uh, uh, other people have other meetings they have to get to. Um, thank you, Rosa. Thank, thank you, you, everyone who yeah. has been a part of today. Um, I mean, this has been just you know, um, an amazing time. Uh, and wanted to make sure everyone knew that this has been recorded. This will live on the We Video page on the remote learning page. So if you haven't been to the website, just go to wevideo.com, click on education. Uh, remote learning and then this webinar will be recorded there and there's other resources for you as well for remote learning uh, any questions that you have we'd be happy to answer them again um continue to share out the goodness the chat will be also recorded so if you wanted to connect with somebody on the you know on the panel today you'll be able to access this chat again and you'll be able to see everyone's username i think erica i uh, posted a google doc earlier with everyone's mm -hmm. Uh, Twitter handles. So that's um, fantastic. You'll be able to look at the video and find the Google Doc and then be able to access that. Yeah, so, I, love, I love this, uh, the chat going back and forth. And then Ted said, this is the best Wednesday of the week. So I love yeah, that too. I agree. I, I wish that we could just keep this chat open, uh, which I think we can. So um, <laughs> the hashtag is what's your story, hashtag what's your story. And that's the one we've been using today. So let's keep the conversation going on the hashtag and thank you all for inspiring me thank you for being a part of today and we are looking forward to staying in touch through social media and uh, if we can be of any assistance to you either myself or rochelle please reach out to us uh, we are happy to help you in any way absolutely thanks all everyone right. thanks everyone have a great day see ya